Yo, 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 yo! What's up, all you burners, stoners, and potheads out there? This is Weedman420 with the Weedman420 Chronicles. How are all you vipers doing out there? Mrs. Weedman. Mr. Weedman. How the hell are you? I'm all right. All righty then. <laughs> <laughs> hey, everybody out in the world, hopefully you're smoking a big fat doink while you're listening to the show. Mrs. Weedman is still eating edibles right now, so I'm going to smoke real quick, and Mrs. Weedman's going to talk about a new show we're watching. Yeah, what are you smoking? I just smoke in the home grow, a little, uh, little Majin Fujita. Nice. Yes, nice. yes. The new plant's looking good. I posted a picture of it, too. She's oh, a beauty. Oh, man, the, the, by Tarantula Genetics, the strawberry kush breath. Woo-hoo, she's looking pretty. Four yeah. weeks in the, in the flower right now. Buds are starting to pop. Seeing the terpenes around the leaves. and around, Oh, man, it's looking hotty, hotty, hotty. Can't wait to smoke her. So, <laughs> Miss Weedman, tell about that new show we're watching. We talked about... Uh, Curb your enthusiasm. We don't watch that show every night because it gets fucking annoying. <laughs> uh, so it's like a show when we really don't have anything to watch. But we caught this new show. Tell oh them my about gosh. it. The fabulous gemstones. Oh my gosh, it's pretty funny. Um, I think whether you have a faith background or not, you could find some humor in it. But it basically is about a kind of a mega church Christian family and all of the hypocrisies and all of the very typical cliches that come along with oh, being man. those people. Oh. oh my God. And they are just pretty on stage, but watch out what happens behind the scenes. It's crazy. Um, so it's been kind of fun. It's pretty comical. Oh uh, my God. We John Goodman laugh. is yep. the main character, the dad. Uh, it's just, it's entertaining. It's a good show. If you have a chance to watch it's it, it's on HBO cheesy. Max. Yes. It's kind of a lot of cheesy. It's funny. It's on HBO Max. I would, <laughs> um, I would watch it. It's pretty funny, yeah. pretty cliche. It's pretty like, oh my God, I can't believe they just did that mm-hmm. kind of thing. Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and we are in full on puppy mode. Yes. We, what are we? Two full weeks into she puppy is, and she's, she's 10 weeks old now. Too. A handful. Um, takes us back to child rearing days. <laughs> <laughs> and two puppy Sleepless days. Sleepless nights. And yeah. yeah, we had two puppies. We had two kids. Yeah. Life was chaotic. Not so much anymore. We gave ourselves and a little we just, bit of a break. Yeah, we threw a puppy in the mix Oof. and holy cow. Yeah, she's taking up some time. Mr. Weedman's been doing the uh, nighttime walks and waking up two and three times a night to w- let her out. I've been getting up earlier with, th- with her in the morning. I think she's out. We're both working from home for the most part. And I feel like we're outside every hour, every half hour, every 50. <laughs> she, know, she knows if she rings the bell, she gets to go outside. So she's... Uh, we we put her in her crate for the for the show because she was a little too wild right now. Yeah, she didn't want to sit still. Wild. Yeah, she didn't want to sit still. She wanted to play, and we actually played with her for like a full thirty minutes before that we recorded. And, she didn't. Uh, she doesn't care. No, we. She just I mean, wanted to run around. I gave her treats and toy and nothing. She just wanted to sniff and run around. They were just. Uh, hopefully, when she gets older, she'll just sleep. Lay by our feet and relax while we do the show. But right now, boy, she is... I love Too her. She's busy. the cutest little puppy in the world. Great little puppy. But boy, she is a busy, busy little beaver. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what. She's nuts. Whew. Anyway, something really cool happened, though, too. Yeah. Somebody put a tattoo of us on yeah. their calf. And that somebody happens to be Tez from West Australia. Tez, you are the man, brother. That is absolutely, man, humbled us. Actually, I will tell you something who even who was honored and humbled even more. And that was our niece, Littles, who drew that for us. And I sent it to her, Tez. And I tell you what, she was honored and privileged. Her dad sent me, my brother sent me a a. a, 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 a text message too and just like she was blown away and adding yuki in there was clutch my brother clutch pretty, pretty cool vip for life we're f- <laughs> we are flattered we are kind of speechless we yes. weren't sure what to say yes <laughs> just that we love it brother man appreciate you vip for life and the we met 420 chronicles show that's for sure pretty sweet appreciate it thank you very sweet and uh the picture of the trucks too you've been saying mrs weed man she's been digging the truck the truck photos too of your old truck <laughs> <laughs> so thank you Tess, from nice. West Australia. appreciate it got another email too from a listener and pretty cool i'm gonna uh read it real quick this gentleman's name is ian hutton and uh he just wanted to say how much he appreciates the show and loves the show and and uh on, on Instagram follows us and he and he hasn't watched Curb His Enthusiasm yet, but he'll be sure to check it out on HBO Max. Um, he sent me a a, a hip hop song that he did called 420 in Heaven." I'm gonna play it at the end of the show 
But Ian, this one's for you, brother. I, I, I really enjoyed it. Mrs. Weeman actually really liked it too. So I'll play it and hopefully you guys enjoy it too. It's called uh Ford it's called um four twenty in heaven. And you can find it on Spotify. That's where I found it. So uh let's get started with the show, Mrs. Wee Man. Let's go. Let's do this. Yo yo. Genotype and phenotype. Just a little bit more conclusion into the last episode that I talked about, uh cultivars and knowing your strains and stuff like that. This is uh what are cannabis phenotypes and genotypes? When it comes to the world of cannabis cultivation, the right knowledge is very important. This will be a very big determinant in the success of cultivation process. This is why in this article they'll be looking into two words that have commonly been missed and interchanged for each and uh, other among many cannabis growers. Phenotype and genotype are two common words used in the world of biology because they do a great deal of explaining the makeup of every organism. They are also very important in the world of cannabis cultivation, as they provide a detailed insight into the in, in, intricate nature and makeup of cannabis plants. The need for the differentiation between phenotypes and genotypes is because the variations and observations noted by cannabis growers and cannabis plants, and it's very important that the wrong notion isn't allowed to fly around. The said observation is that cannabis plants that are grown from the same seeds seem to have physical differences which then begs the question of whether the phenotype or genotype is the root cause of these differences. The differences range from cannabis plant height, taste, smell, flavor, and even effects. Some of you growers out there, I, I, I've been learning. I've talked about genotypes and phenotypes before, but this was a new article I read, and I was really interested on it. So could be wrong. I could be right. This article could be wrong. This article could be right. But give me your opinion also. I'm always interested in hearing other people's opinions or what other people know and their knowledge is, and I can always share it. So a closer look at genotype and phenotype. To fully understand the phenomenon, we will start by looking carefully into the genotype entails. In simple terms, genotype refers to the genetic makeup or genetic information that characterizes the traits that are observed in living organisms. The genetic information determines the appearance, growth, scent, flavor that can be seen in the cannabis plant. It is, however, necessary to point out that the genotype of a cannabis plant doesn't state with certainty that the characteristics that will be seen in the cannabis plant, instead it offers a range of possibilities. A very important determinant in the form with uh, which the information coded in the genetics of a cannabis plant expresses itself is the environment. We cannot talk about the genotype of the cannabis plant and the role it plays with the final results seen in the cannabis plant without taking about the environment. The factors of the environment play a huge role in determining which of the parts of the genotype get to the activated and expressed in the cannabis plant. As said earlier, the genotype doesn't determine what finally gets expressed and only contains a range of possible traits that can be expressed. It is the interaction with the environment that accounts for the characters to be seen. In the final product of the genetic information in the environment and the interaction between the genotype and the environment is what's called the phenotype. The phenotype is the physical result after the different factors in the environment trigger the activities, some of the genetic information embedded in the genetic makeup of the cannabis plant. For every cannabis grower, the importance of the different factors and conditions that must be maintained in the growing area are well known as these play a huge role in the success of the cultivation process. These factors, too, are to be thanked to a large extent for the uniqueness that is seen among some plants of the same strain. The effect of this can be seen when you consider seeds from the same cannabis strain being grown indoors and outdoors. The effects of temperature, light, humidity, and other factors will play a very huge role in the physical characteristics of the plant, as the outdoor plant can be seen to have plants with richer purple colors in comparison to the cannabis plants that are grown indoors. Why do plants grown in the same environment have differences? Now, the explanation regarding the phenotype and genotype gives the good basis for the reason why seeds from the same cannabis plant can express themselves differently. Some are bad bitches, some are not. Mm -hmm. That's just what I'm, what I'm guessing. Based on the environment they are exposed to, there still remains another observation is that is very common among different cannabis growers, which is, this, is that seeds of the cannabis plants that are grown under the same condition can also have different phenotypes. The observation begs the question as, the, as to what else a role influencing the physical outcome of the cannabis plant. The common misassumption that occurs here is that many believe the reason for these variations in cannabis plants that are grown under the same conditions is because of their phenotype. This is why it was necessary for us to first establish the environment expressed the phenotype from the genotype and not the other way around. The question still remains as to what the root cause of the difference is and the answer lies in the genotype. 
Many cannabis growers expect that genotype of the seeds of cannabis plants should be identical since they come from the same origin. The truth, however, is, is that it always been a huge misassumption. Unlike the ex expectation of the genotypes are identical, they are usually similar but still contain differences between them. And a simple way to express this is through identical twins. Contrary to the expectation that the genetic information should express themselves completely alike, they are actually like siblings. This explains the uniqueness and variations that are seen in cannabis seeds from the same origin grown under the same environmental conditions. The influence, taste, smell, order, and shape of the cannabis plant as the individual seeds have individual genetic codes. Here's another part of it. Hybrids and clones. The knowledge of the difference between phenotype and genotype is also important when it comes to making a hi of hybrids an expected result. Hybrids are bred for the ability to join the beneficial characteristics of indica strains and sativa strains, and the knowledge of these relationships will be important when plants have dominant sativa genetic, yet still show more indica characteristics. Don't forget that is the plant we're talking about, the style of the plant we're talking about. Uh, if the goal is to have the same cannabis plant with identical characteristics, clones are the way to go. The genotype of the young plant will be the same as, the, as that of the mother plant, and when grown in the same environment, they will express with the same types of physical characteristics. Um, so I thought it was really interesting. The next one we're going to read from this from these articles is Cannabis Genetics and, and, and more. So uh, this is a three-part series, so I thought it was pretty cool to share with everybody. It's just learning more and more. And like I said, I know I've talked about this before. We've had people on the show, you know, talked about this. But to me, it's important that I keep on learning and growing. Hopefully, it's helping everybody out there. So mood, moods, moods, yeah, moods. What moods. about them moods? When are, you you're, in a, are you in a good mood? Uh, finally, I got high. That's good. I Mr. Weedman's not mood. feeling so good. No, Mr. Weedman had your edible kicked in. No, it no, didn't yet. Didn't right? yet? Oh, no. then I'm just really high. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I, I think I had uh, food poisoning. <clears throat> yeah. Or it could be the stomach influenza that's going around in Illinois right now, but I was... Sick. Pre yeah. You're bad. puking. I was puking. And I don't know. It was last coming, time out, it was coming out both ends, though, at one, okay. at one point. Okay. <laughs> I don't think anybody wants to know that. <laughs> it was, though. Uh, it was brutal. TMI, TMI. And yesterday, I, I didn't want anything. I didn't eat. I, I had all I had was water. I didn't even want. I didn't even want to consume cannabis. I just wanted to go in bed, and I had to work, and it was miserable, and I was pissed off. And yeah. Yuki was even annoying me. Everything was annoying me yesterday because all I was doing was even running to the me? bathroom. Uh, yes. Yeah. Everybody. Shit. I'm not gonna lie. <laughs> I'm not gonna be, it I'm happens. Not, it, it just. It was everything in the world was bothering me. I know. And the world was falling apart at work too. Oh, so I geez. got up from like having like a really bad <laughs> night, getting no sleep, taking Yuki out three times, puking all night. And then all of a sudden, I wake up to like 30 emails and the world was fucking imploding. Whoa. So it was miserable. But I feel great Terrible. now. Good. Do you know why? Because you smoked weed. Right. And because cannabis Honestly. helps nausea. Yeah. I but told yes, you, but, but you yes, were so I, afraid. I couldn't. No, I just, yes, I couldn't do, I didn't want anything. My body right. hurt yesterday. I, my, I mean, like, to the point where I, I, I felt like I worked out for like eight hours straight. Oof. And my body was that sore for like. Like, I couldn't even pick up my own body weight yesterday. Wow. It was brutal. So, sorry about that, everyone. I just felt like shit. So, uh, well, let's get in a yeah. better mood. Yeah. How does... How this does... is super cool. This is an article about how mood and vibe can change the way weed makes you feel. So, I talk about a lot when you are trying to get to understand cannabis, how important your mood is and your vibe, right? Like, the way that you experience cannabis will affect how you enjoy cannabis or don't enjoy cannabis. So this article backs that up. For cannabis users, the where, how, and with whom can sometimes make all of the difference. For instance, you may have an eighth of truly incredible cannabis flower in your pocket, but with the wrong people, the wrong setting, and the wrong overall vibe, that weed might as well be oregano. Set and setting is not only key in determining how enjoyable a given cannabis experience is, but can also influence a user's potential for abuse of the substance. What does set and setting mean? The principles of set and setting have existed for centuries and were even used hundreds of years ago to describe using hashish. More contemporarily, however, the term took hold during research into psychedelic drugs in the 1960s and was made famous by Harvard professor Timothy Leary, and he was also a psychedelics pioneer. Um, in short, set refers to one's mindset, and setting refers to your physical and social surroundings. So set and setting. 
As one academic paper put it, set and setting refers to the physiological, social, and cultural parameters which shape the response to psychedelic drugs, including hash. The term holds that the character of a psychedelic experience is determined first and foremost by the user's character, expectations, and intentions, or their set, right? As well as by the social and physical surroundings in which the drug experience takes place, your setting. Think of it as something like nature versus nurture of drugs. The question asks how much are the effects of a substance purely the result of how it affects the body physically and how much of it is derived from how, where, and with whom the user consumed and what their intentions and even their mood are. How much can these effects be predicted and how much do they depend on the society and culture in which the drug is consumed? Looking at the extra pharmacological variables, psychedelic scholar Ido Hartog. Hartogson, Hartogson. You just budgeted it. Yeah, you know, I try. <laughs> he wrote um, that it is key to developing, the key is to develop strategies for harm reduction and a more effective drug policy, which would reduce drug harms and allow the emergence of more beneficial patterns of drug use. So he's essentially saying that if you incorporated the set and setting, right, and you didn't have all these extra variables, that could affect your experience, that it would help reduce harm when you're taking these drugs. Pretty cool. Yeah. And of course, these principles are meant to apply equally to cannabis. And by the way, I am high. I knew <laughs> My it. Edible I, I knew it. I, knew I wasn't it. even aware of it. I that fucking caught your face. I caught the way you were talking. I knew it. I fuck, I'm weed man 420. I fucking knew when you were uh, high. I'm like, I'm not high. <laughs> Everybody out in the Shut world. Up, Mr. Weed man. I knew she was high. Shut up. When you got I'm having a beer too. It's a you good are. one. Which one are you drinking? I'm drinking Maplewood Brewing. It's a Chicago microbrewery, and it's called Juicy, Juicy, Juicy. You like that one? You've been it's drinking it a little bit here and there. I thought I got no, no. Son of Juice. Son of Juice. It Son of juice, juice is juicy, juicy, yeah, juicy. It is juicy. Son juicy. of juice. It's an India pale ale. It is yummy. It's a good beach beer. Mm, let me get a sip. Mm. Okay, back to the story. And of course, these principles are meant to apply equally to cannabis. So they're talking a lot in this article about psychedelics, but how these same theories can be uh, used when consuming cannabis. Now, you might be asking, how do set and setting affect marijuana use or cannabis use? Just like anyone should want their mind and body to be in the right place before taking psychedelics, the same is true with cannabis. I agree 100%. The, and uh, sometimes you're not really controlling the set or setting, but at least when you're getting used to cannabis and understanding cannabis and how cannabis makes you feel, I think set and setting are hands down the most important thing. Yeah, 100%. Once you're like a seasoned consumer, you can be in pretty much any same environment. Thing. And if you feel funky, it's like, okay, it's the weed. It's the same thing with mushrooms too. Right. Well, I don't know about that. and stuff like that. Yeah. You got to be in the right setting. Yeah. Well, this is the case for both medical and recreational cannabis users. For medical users, consuming cannabis in a supportive, positive environment can potentially make it more likely to help ease the symptoms of whichever health condition you're treating. Also, replicating the same controlled environment in subsequent sessions will provide medical cannabis patient and recreational users a better chance of comparing and determining which specific cannabis products work best for them and recreating that experience. What factors qualify as set and setting? Well, set and setting refer to the person in question's mental and physical condition at the time of the session uh, and their environment in which they consume the substance. For set, this can be whether or not you're highly stressed or feeling anxious when you consume cannabis or if you're free of any responsibilities taking up bandwidth in your mind and stifling your ability to unwind. Mindset can also be if you're feeling fatigued, ill, or the opposite, if your body is telling you it's time to stay up late and make it a long night, or just time to hit the sack. Setting is perhaps a bit more straightforward. It entails the environment in which you consume and whether or not it is conducive to a positive experience. A negative setting could be one in which the people you're with make you anxious or annoyed, or where their level of tolerance and their intent for the cannabis session is completely different from yours. It could be a setting in which you feel unsafe, unable to fully relax and enjoy the experience. The setting can 
either improve the sensation given by cannabis products or make what could be an otherwise enjoyable experience a negative one. For instance, you may have a cannabis product that creates an energetic, uplifting high that would be great for a night out with friends or an afternoon at an outdoor concert. But alone on a stressful evening or hanging out with acquaintances you might not be too fond of could make that high energy cannabis high more stress than it is worth. Yeah, you don't want that. Yeah, you don't want that. So can the wrong set and setting make paranoia or anxiety more likely? One of the more well-known short-term effects of cannabis is paranoia. It can cause what can be an otherwise pleasant high to descend into fear, anxiety, and for some people, even panic attacks. For many cannabis users, this can manifest itself in the form of getting very high and going to the store and hearing a voice inside whispering over and over that everyone knows you're high. Everybody knows you're high. Hey, you're high. They all know. Guess what? You're high. Hey, you're high. Yeah, that can happen in your brain. <laughs> Especially for like yes. first timers, you're first high. couple times. Yeah. Oh, you're real high and they know it. <laughs> right? Your brain is telling you those things. Well, a 2015 study found that THC triggers paranoid thoughts in vulnerable people, but also asserted that the most likely mechanism of action causing paranoia was the generation of negative effect and anomalous experiences. An anomalous experience is um, something like a mystical or an out-of-body experience. So this shouldn't come as too much of a surprise for anyone who has consumed cannabis for some time, including in a variety of social settings. Using cannabis with people who even in a sober state would make you uneasy or who have an overly intense way about them can create a negative experience. If you're someone who often gets introverted or introspective on cannabis, then using it in a social setting, in particular with people you don't know well, could worsen that effect. Or if you find yourself in a situation with people who uh, you don't want knowing that you use cannabis, such as coworkers or your in-laws, it could spark paranoia, embarrassment, or a desire to find a corner and hide. Cannabis-induced anxiety and paranoia can also be affected by how safe you feel. A classic example could be when a police car pulls up behind you and you've consumed cannabis. Hopefully you're not the driver, number one, but this will cause your heart rate to speed up and uh, as the panic will rise in your throat, right? Cannabis patients and recreational users should be mindful of their triggers for bad experiences and focus on settings that put them at ease. If you have a favorite spot in your house where you like to use cannabis, an album that even after the 10,000th spin still puts a smile on your face, then try to recreate those settings when you can. If you have a friend you'd like to spend time with uh, and you've just picked up a new bag of weed, then try to focus on these people in these environments when your aim is to optimize your high. You should also be mindful of your own mental and physical health. For instance, if you, when you're feeling anxious or depressed, you find that cannabis worsens the condition, then consider laying off of it until you feel better. If you're worried about a big test or job interview later this week and know that getting high may ramp up your stress a couple notches, then maybe it's worth waiting until the weekend. But set and setting may not only affect how positive the effects of cannabis or any drug is. They can also play a big role in how the user consumes the drug, the safety of their consumption, and the likelihood of abuse. If we zoom out and take a societal look at cannabis use, there's evidence that set and setting can play a big role in how people use cannabis and how likely they may be to abuse it. As cannabis enters the mainstream, this evidence is worth careful consideration. A study published in the International Journal of Drug Policy in 2015 examined a series of interviews with baby boomer cannabis users in the San Francisco Bay Area and found that they had made harm reduction choices partly based on why, when, where, and with whom to use. The study found that participants followed rituals or cultural practices characterized by sanctions that defined norm or acceptable cannabis use and concluded that these cultural practices may prove to be more effective than formal legal prohibition in reducing cannabis-related harms. In other words, people have a tendency to observe how others in their social circle consume cannabis and to alter their own behavior accordingly. Meanwhile, a 1975 study from the American Journal of Drug Abuse found a direct link between societal setting and drug and alcohol use, saying that controlled drug use patterns are primarily supported by the development of social drug-using situations 
in which sanctions and rituals permit use while condemning abuse. Interesting. Set and setting can can also entail deciding on the intentions of your cannabis use as part of your mindful approach to consumption. How does this play out? Using cannabis with intent means that during any particular session, you decide beforehand what you're looking to accomplish. Do you want to take one or two puffs just to uh, have enough to feel a slight buzz and take off the edge? Do you want to consume a large or very potent amount and have a highly intoxicated stoned experience for the next couple hours? Or are you just looking for a nice sleep aid or a gentle boost to make your morning yoga session a little more enjoyable? By defining your intentions, you can take charge of the setting in which you consume cannabis, potentially improving your ability to control the high and the sensations that you feel, instead of just reacting to them. Keep in mind that certain levels of intoxication may be rather unavoidable avoidable depending on what you ingest. For instance, if you decide to smoke half a moon rock in one sitting, then your intentions may be of scant influence on the final result. Yeah. Yeah, smoke that moon rock, yo. <laughs> in addition to set and setting, a number of often overlooked factors can affect how you experience weed. This is interesting. We talk about this, the endocannabinoid system. Well, there is something called the endocannabinoid tone. This refers to the vitality and overall condition of the endocannabinoid system in a particular person's body. If the tone is imbalanced, it can affect the functioning of the system modulated by the endocannabinoid system and potentially alter how the body responds to cannabis. Whoa. Interesting. Intense. Science, science, science. Yeah. Tolerance. An individual's tolerance can be a key component in how they react to cannabis products. Someone with a high tolerance can have a very different experience than someone with a less robust tolerance, regardless of the set and setting. Your delivery method. How you ingest your cannabis, smoking, vaping, or with edibles, can also make a difference in your experience. And chemovar, or strain. The chemical composition of the cannabis plant will not only vary between chemovars, but also between batches from the same grower. The chemical composition can also change over time from exposure to light and air and even just aging. Just as set and setting are important for both cannabis and psychedelics, the same is true when you combine the two. In a 2019 survey, it was found that when cannabis is combined with psilocybin, the active psychedelic compound in magic mushrooms, users can feel more enhanced senses and more intense hallucinations. Ultimately, though, whatever biochemical reactions may take place when the cannabis is combined with hallucinogens, set and setting is likely to be more important. Who you consume hallucinogens with and under what mental and physical state you are in when you do so is key to whether or not you have a good trip or a bad trip, regardless of cannabis being involved or not. I really like that article. It was a good one. pretty cool. Yeah, it helped you understand like a little bit more about Mm -hmm. what you might be going through or not going through or want to go through. Right. Well, and I think that, you know, we make the point um, street weed and going to a dispensary are night and day differences. So most I smoke some pretty good. I'm I'm not saying not though. good. No, here's <laughs> this is my this is strictly now, my point. Not back in the nineties shit, but now, yeah. I'm not talking about quality of the bud. I'm talking about the idea that you can go in looking for a specific result. You want to feel yeah. X, Y, and Z. When you used to get weed from your the guy back in the street, in the day, you yeah. might have had one or two choices, and it was a sativa or, or an indica, then, and that's no, all you there knew. Was nothing back then like that. It was here. This is what I got. Take it or leave it. Right, right. But what would you call the weed that I grow? Would um, you call that street weed or no. medical cannabis? Because I grow it because I have a medical card. What would you call it? Like street weed, meaning like I grow it from home. You get it from me. It's just it's home grow. Home grow. Just that's what you grow. consider it. Man, I want. Well, that's be called, what you consider. I want to be called street weed. Well, <laughs> you have to go out and get a side hustle and start selling it on the corner. Yeah, it's been done before. <laughs> then it's street weed. It's been done before. Okay. Well, now we have home grow because we're home all grow. grown up. That's it. Home grow. <laughs> what was the point? What was my point? We were trying to make a point. I don't remember. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Oh my gosh. <laughs> Get on with your bad self. What's All our right. next story? We're going to talk a little about <laughs> CBN. And uh, this article is talking about how it's overhyped. I've talked about CBN before. So we'll go into this article. Uh, I've taken products with CBN in it. I even like when my weed gets a little bit older and it's got a little CBN and mm-hmm. it helps me sleep. But this article says different. Or it's saying that maybe too much. Or it's overhyped. So let's see. The connection between cannabis and sleep is far more complex than simple assumptions. Weed makes you sleepy. 
As all things cannabis, the truth behind the trope is difficult to deduce to layman's terms. This makes the industry, especially its consumers, vulnerable to misinformation. End users are, are often misinformed, confused, or even proposally misled by brands implementing marketing ploys aimed at selling expensive products. The cannabinoid CBN, which I've talked about. It's a really high cannabinoid right now, so uh, which has been lauded as a miracle sleep molecule, is a perfect example. Like most buzzy trends in cannabis, the focus on high THC, the fixation on indica and sativa, the idea that rosin is a higher quality than resin. CBN is more of a marketing term than wonder cannabinoids made out to be, and it's a pricey one at that. The idea that CBN equals uh, equals sleep is where lazy science, negligent industry myth-making, and low consumer knowledge collide, says scientist Carolina Vac- Vasquez-Mitchell. So not my opinion. I, d- I thought this article was very, very good. So I, I-, I always play both parts. I, I see... You know, I got I got to be that person. So Vasquez Mitchell has sent spent years studying the effects of cannabis on sleep in the formulation of her product Dreamant, one of, the, of my favorite cannabis sleep aids on the market. It reduces the burden on the product developers to actually review scientific literature when they create these uh, products, and it gives marketers a very simple way to explain what their products are supposed to do. But in my opinion, this is disingenuous. Uh, CBN is a cannabinoid that is produced when tetrahydrocannabinol, THC, is degraded by air, heat, light, or acids. Some research has shown uh, CBN to have similar effects to THC, though between the 4 and 10 times weaker. In short, it's just old THC that is no longer as effective. To get more granular on the current research, one study showed THC plus CBN is no more efficient than THC alone. Interesting. Another showed you would need nine times the amount of CBN to get the sleep effect of THC. The plot thickens. <laughs> and yet another study gave 1,200 milligrams of CBN. Typical CBN doses in cannabis products are one to five milligrams to subjects and yielded no sleep effects. And I've also been told that I've said in the show uh, higher than like two milligrams, three milligrams induces nightmares. So I, this is what she's talking about. I got to play devil's advocate. You know, I take CBN, so I want to know more about it. According to Vasquez Mitchell, it's also important to note CBN binds two times weaker to the CBN1 receptors than THC. The CBN1 receptors are the only cannabinoid receptors that regulate sleep. While CBN isn't the most, uh, isn't the miracle cannabinoid marketers make it out to be, it can still make you feel sleepy. Because CBN is nothing more than degraded THC, and THC is the most active cannabinoid in the sleep cycle. But simply adding CBN to a product when labeling it for sleep is both reductive and deceptive. So does it work? THC and CBD in a ratio of a 2-5 to 1 have been shown to be the most effective ratio for inducing sleep quickly and without the risk of becoming stressed or paranoid. So, all right, so a 2 to THC, a 5 to CBD, and a 1 to to CBN. Wow. And this is what um, uh, Vas- uh, the scientist Vasquez Mitchell said. But the cannabinoids only help with deep sleep. Ooh, I want some deep sleep. And have been shown to hurt your REM sleep in long term. REM sleep is crucial to your cognitive function and your ability to store memories. In order to foster a healthy night's sleep, you have to supplement the cannabinoids with non-cannabis ingredients that help REM. Like... Um, Lavender root, uh, val- valerian root. Um, what's the other one? Not melatonin. The other one um, begins with a C. Chamomile. Chamomile. Not melatonin. Do not take melatonin with with CBN or, or products like melatonin. Actually hurts you. You want to do chamomile and lavender and valerian root and certain terpenes that help with that. So, but while plenty of weed sleep products seem to focus only on marketing, there are very, there are a few uh, brands that in this article. Uh, that help, says they help with proper sleep. And I am not going to read them because none of these, nobody gave me anything to try. So I'm not going <laughs> to <I'm not gonna laughs> promote them. So, but anyway, I thought it was interesting because I do take CBN uh, and I do like it. Um, but like I said, if it's just extra THC and it's helped me put to sleep, that's fine. Uh, but like I said, I don't take it all the time. I smoke more than I take uh, CBN gummies and all that kind of stuff. So um, here's something I've, you know, I've had many grinders in my life mm-hmm. and I've never cleaned them. No, ever. Even I just buy, I scrape everything out of it, and right. if it doesn't work anymore, I went and bought a new one. Or mm-hmm. someone gave me one as a gift, so I just started using that one. 
the one thing about granite is don't forget they do get because they get so much resin on it from the from the uh, from the turp, uh, the trichomes and, and they're bursting all over the place. So they it does get harder and harder to use. It takes a few years. Yeah. But you do just like anything. You do want to <laughs> clean your stuff. You just want to make sure you get all the good stuff out of it, like your keef at the bottom. You yep. know. But Mrs. Weed Man's gonna teach me and teach all of you about what. Cleaning your weed grinder. There you go. There you go. This is important. Got to keep your tools clean, That's right? That's it. Well, a uh, quick test. Open your cannabis grinder. How does it look? Spotlessly clean, hopefully? No? Okay. Well, shame on you then. <laughs> Get that grinder cleaned out this instant because your lung health is paramount. Trust me, I know. If you don't know how to clean your grinder, keep listening because we do. I'm going to talk you through the why, the when, and the how of cleaning out your weed grinder, and your lungs can thank you for it. Grinders usually come in the form of metal uh, or plastic acrylic, um, and there are different protocols for cleaning each. Metal grinders are naturally more durable, so they can withstand a deeper clean than their lighter plastic counterparts. Herb grinders usually always consist of a lid and a base, or a lid, a base to catch your ground up flower, and a third compartment underneath to catch your precious keef that falls loose during the grinding. Remember that those tasty buds you grind were once living plant matter, and as such, that matter will decompose over time. That leads to bacteria, and bacteria can make you sick. Even worse, if you keep your stash and equipment in a warm, dark place, chances are you'll get mold. And that can cause a multitude of health problems. Your grinder can get clogged up with old, dried chunks of weed, and that can cause a problem with the efficiency of your grinder's ability to break up your bud. If you've ever tried to grind some bud and found it didn't break up nicely, you may have blamed the bud. But it's easily just as likely that your grinder's functionality is no longer operating at its peak of its power. You need to clean your grinder fairly frequently, but you also need to check your grinder's pieces regularly. If you use it daily, you'll find that over time, the resin will build up and get trapped in the teeth or the nooks and can hurt how well it works. I just said that. Yeah. Like anything <laughs> else, I know, uh, I used your grinder and it like one piece like just wouldn't get chopped up in there. Yeah. Not the new one. The new one's new. The other one, the old one yeah, you used. Yeah, that one. one was tight. Yeah. If you use it daily, you'll find that over time the resin will build up and get trapped in the teeth or the nooks and it can hurt how well it works. Like anything else, routine maintenance is necessary. Grinder cleaning frequency will depend on how frequently you use your grinder. Keep an eye on things. If it looks filthy, clean it at least once a month or so. Much like you would a bong. Well, a bong you're going to clean more than once a month if you're we using hope. it. Yeah. Schedule a clean for every six weeks or so to prolong the life of your grinder and keep everything tip top. Here's how to clean your grinder. You're going to need the following tools. Uh, some Ziploc bags to put your residue in if need be. A bowl to put your grinder in for cleaning. A tray or clean surface to catch your resin. A toothbrush or some small type of soft brush, even a clean, previously unused paintbrush, a toothpick, cocktail stick, or a similar item. If your grinder is acrylic or plastic, some warm water, not hot water, and dish soap. For a metal grinder, some isopropyl rubbing alcohol. Do not use that on the plastic, though. Uh, also paper towels or a clean dish towel for drying. Step one, to begin the cleaning process, empty your grinder of any contents. Separate the different parts of the grinder. Give each section a good knock on the surface of your tray to release as much of the stuck-on resin and plant material as you can. Step two, put your dirty grinder in the freezer for about 30 minutes. This will make any remaining residue easier to remove. Remember, oh, I though, didn't know that. Yeah. That's good. Remember, though, that plastic becomes brittle at freezer temperature, so handle your plastic grinder with care. Step three, give your grinder a few more gentle taps to see if you can free off any more dry herb. Then get to work with your toothbrush or some similar type of brush or a Q-tip, uh, loosening off as much of the remaining gunk as you can from the various grinder parts. Work the teeth of the grinder well and the grinder screen. Follow up with a toothpick uh, if you need to pick at stubborn pieces. Step four, the method changes depending on whether you have a plastic or a metal grinder. Pay close attention here. Your grinder's life is in your hands. Remember, metal rusts in water and plastic warps in sol solvents. 
If you have a metal grinder, submerge the separate compartments in a bowl or bag of isopropyl alcohol. This will loosen off any last remaining remnants of debris and give your grinder a really good deep clean. If you have a plastic or acrylic grinder, submerge the separate compartments in a bowl of soap and water. Remember, you don't want it to be so hot that it starts to melt or warp your grinder. And don't leave your grinder in there for year, or for hours, not years. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely not a year. If your grinder has both plastic and metal parts, Godspeed. Submerging is not a great idea, and you'll have to get really busy with that toothbrush. Keep an eye on things until you see the color of the alcohol or water changing to a darker, murkier color. Dirty water equals a clean grinder, and this should take just a matter of minutes. Step five, use tongs to remove your grinder from soaking, and if it looks clean, proceed to give it a nice final quick rinse and leave it to dry or dry it with paper towels. Then reassemble your shiny, clean grinder and enjoy your now finely ground nugs. There you go. Super cool. There you go. I never really thought about cleaning the grinder. I don't and we always I... talk about like you you save all that little bit of keef. Oh, the keef is great. Yeah. But I mean, you collect it after a certain amount of time. But I, I mean, personally, I have never once cleaned the grinder that I've owned. Well. Ever. Put another to-do on your to-do list. I know. I know. I'm saving that article. Hmm. So... Uh, Biden Treasury Secretary says Congress cannabis banking in action is extremely frustrating. And this is the, I think the, the Banking Act is very important for cannabis uh, it, because it'll save it, all these dispensaries and cultivators and all the people. Uh, listen, I'll, I'll give you an example. Mr. and Mrs. We man have things going on and we're trying to we tried to find a bank. And it was the biggest fucking pain in the ass because we do a podcast and it's a cannabis podcast. So trying to find a bank that would that would. Uh, Use a can. Let us use their bank as a cannabis company. How long did it take you? It took a while. Yeah, it took yeah. a while. A lot of no's. A lot of no's. So you no's. found the yes. So we need the Safe Banking Act for people to in the cannabis industry, so they can put their money somewhere. And you know, instead of getting robbed using all cash, it's rough, man. You gotta be careful. Uh, Georgia lawmakers failed to pass bill implementing medical cannabis industry. Georgia. On my mind, man. Come on. Failed to agree on a bill to legalize production and sale of medical cannabis products, even uh, through uh, low THC. Cannabis-based oil has been permitted for registered patients since 2015. According to the Atlanta Journal-Constitution, the state Senate uh, tabled House Bill 1425 on a 28-27 to 27 vote. They missed it by like, oh my God. Uh, using it before the 2022 legislative session adjourned for the year. Ugh. Ugh. Breaking my heart, George, on my mind. Uh, D.C. lawmaker rejects bill to effectively legalize cannabis sales for adults and crack down on gifting market. Uh, this is big. D.C. is great because you can just gift weed uh, to people, grow it. You can grow, I think, up to 10 plants, and you can gift your weed to anybody you want. Mm-hmm. And, and it just Washington, D.C. lawmakers um, – Rejected a measure to effectively circumvent a congressional ban on local uh, locality legalizing adult use cannabis sales by allowing adults 21 and older to self-certify themselves in medical cannabis patients without needing a doctor's recommendation. This is brutal. Come on, hmm. D.C. Uh, states collected more than $3.7 billion in recreational cannabis tax revenue in 2021, report finds. $3.7 billion. Bill- b- 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 billion. That's a lot of Bs. Jeez. And it just drives me crazy. Uh, this U.S. Farm Bill, uh, there's a proposal and raises some eyebrows about regulating cannabis like corn. A seemingly offbeat idea to finally approve federal cannabis legalization is getting cannabis reform advocates talking. What about adding t- high THC cannabis to low THC hemp in the next Farm Bill? It's an idea a few of the cannabis advocacy community have considered. But the suggestion isn't coming from just any pro-legalization members of Congress. It's an idea from a powerful gatekeeper, the chair of the House of Agricultural Committee, Democrat-Republican David Scott of Georgia. He floated around the idea of a couple of months ago about a hearing powerful testimony from Amber Littlejohn, executive director of Minority Cannabis Business Association. Littlejohn told lawmakers that the small and minority-owned cannabis companies likely won't survive without some help from Congress, adding that the state-level society equity programs have not been able to keep many minority-owned businesses afloat. In response, Scott said that the next farm bill is coming up to 2023 should address the barriers in small businesses and black entrepreneurs face when trying to start legal cannabis companies under the state law. Here we are, the fastest growing agricultural product between hemp and cannabis, he said. We're also going into a farm bill. We've got to address this issue. and We can no longer hide it. After political observers in Washington, D.C. raised their eyebrows about the comment, Scott doubled down. As the chief chair of the House of Agriculture Committee, I am committed to addressing the issue of cannabis in our next farm bill, he wrote. Good for him. That's good stuff. 
Uh, cannabis legalization tied to significant decrease in foster care placements, new study finds. Hmm. Legalizing cannabis for adult use is associated with at least a 10% decrease in foster care admissions on average, according to a new study, including reductions in placements due to physical abuse, neglect, parental in- incarceration, and misuse of alcohol and other drugs. I think that's amazing. Mm-hmm. Pretty good. Only 10%, but still. Uh, here's something fucking funny. And I really, I, I, it's just crazy to me that, that, that Chicago, Illinois would think that people would use, uh, those can, cannabis amnesty boxes yeah, <laughs> at right. O'Hare. They, they, I'm going to give it to them. <laughs> millions of passengers have I can't flown. can't believe it's in my pocket. <laughs> I've flown out of Chicago mm-hmm. since we was fully legalized in Illinois, but only a few dozen have pitched their pot in the cannabis amnesty <laughs> boxes set up by the city's two major airports. I think that's fucking hilarious. Why would you fucking do that? It's just like, I would never <laughs> put that in there. Montana adult use cannabis sales top 15.8 million in March. Good old Montana. I love you. Joe Montana. Oklahoma Supreme Court upholds cannabis legalization ballot initiative following legal challenge by competing campaign. Good for you, Oklahoma. Don't change a thing. Uh, South Carolina moves closer to legalizing medical cannabis. The South Carolina legislator is poised to legalize medical cannabis, but the bill uh, that could make it happen might still fail. The measure is a question. Uh, S-150 has passed uh, the state Senate, but and it was approved uh, easily Thursday by the House Committee after a few amendments the Associated Press reported. So there's a list and stuff. We've talked about this before, so it looks like it might pass. That'd be great. The South might beat the North on that one. Uh, Kentucky governor considers taking action on medical cannabis legalization himself. He might do an executive order if he's able to do it. Good for you. Oh, do it, man. Because the vote by the freaking House screwed it up. So if he can do that, good for you. Do it. I dare you. (laughs) <laughs> DEA, this is a confusing article DEA says cannabis seeds are considered legal hemp as long as they don't exceed THC limit this was weird cannabis might be federally prohibited but the, the Drug Enforcement Administration has effectively acknowledged that the plant seeds are generally uncontrolled and legal regardless of how much THC might end up being produced in buds if those seeds were, were cultivated DEA recently carried out a f- review of federally statute and implementing regulations in response to inquire from the attorney Shane Pennington regarding the legality of cannabis seeds, tissue culture, and the genetic material containing no more than 0.3% THC. The agency affirmed that while they used the case and cannabis seeds were controlled full stop, that's no longer the case because the federal legalization of hemp, as Pennington discussed, is an addition of his On Drugs newsletter of Substack on Monday. Following the enhancement of the farm bill, uh, according to cannabis seeds, that has Delta-9 uh, concentration of not more than 0.3% on dry weight base meets the definition of hemp and thus is not controlled under the CSA. Um, so, com- uh, conversely, cannabis seeds having a Delta-9 uh, concentration of more than 0.3% of dry weight base is controlled in the Schedule 1 under the CSA of cannabis. Because both hemp and cannabis seeds generally contain nominal THC levels that wouldn't exceed a large threshold, DEA is essentially conceding that people can have cannabis seeds no matter how much THC a resulting plant might produce. As long as the seeds themselves contain less than 0.3% Delta-9 THC, of course, it, it continues to be federally illegal to use any cannabis seeds with the intent of growing still prohibited cannabis. And in the view of this letter, significant because it continues to see confusion over the source rule and the argument that the legal status of cannabis products hinges on whether or not it's sourced from cannabis or hemp, influencing legislative proposals even after the federal level Pennington told uh, this uh, marijuana moment in this article. So, crazy stuff. Uh, But, you know, hopefully they can change that law with the hemp bill. We'll see. Stoners, burners, and potheads. The yep. pandemic. Yep. What? What? The pandemic created a new generation of stoners, burners, and potheads. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Americans who rarely, if ever, smoke cannabis before the pandemic now say they're turning to weed to help them cope. Three years ago, Richard Capuano, 32, didn't know how much a gram of cannabis cost. Now, after years of lockdown and an extended period of overwhelming anxiety, he has become something of a weed connoisseur. Capuano was never a stoner. Sure, he dabbled in high school, but beer and mezcal were always his weapon of choice. It wasn't until the summer of 2020, in the pits of COVID despair, that he found himself reformed as a proud, regular toker. In fact, Capuano found himself actually prosthetizing 
about the splendor of cannabis to his friends during the week, weekly online poker games. I was starting to become an advocate, he laughed. I didn't have to inter interact with many people, continues Capuano, who recently became engaged to his girlfriend of five years and moved from Mexican, Mexico City to Houston to facilitate a career pivot. I was cooking and doing dishes. I was sitting and waiting for time to pass. Weed is enjoyable when you're doing these activities. We didn't see my parents or my friends, he adds, but we did see our dealer quite often. <laughs> <laughs> the COVID-19 nightmare sparked a number of shakeups to the social order, a burgeoning our anti-work movement, a sharp economic swoon, and tiresome new polarities in the cultural war. But as lockdown orders marched on, many weed and ag agnostics drove into the community with gusto, forming a new cohort of pandemic-era stoners. According to the data analytics, fir analytics firm Headset, legal cannabis sales increased by 120% in 2020 Man, and 61% in 2021. And Fortune reported that Americans bought $18 billion worth of cannabis in our first coronavirus you year. You bunch of stoners, you. <laughs> that, that's $7 billion more than uh, 2019 transactional figures. There are multiple fact factors at play here. Cannabis is increasingly accessible, with 37 states that have medical cannabis laws on the books, in addition to 18 states that allow recreational use. The trend also coincides with a gradual destigmatization of the drug in the general populace. But clearly, something about the COVID experience sparked a cannabis renaissance in a previously weed neutral household. Overnight, in quarantine dwellings across the land, it seemed that many people were lighting up. COVID upended people's social habits. There were surveys that college students were smoking more and drinking less. Since we didn't have sanctioned places built for public consumption of weed, it's something that people often do in their own home, said Catherine Neal Harris, a professor who studies drug policy at Rice University. I've also seen some surveys that use has gone up in correlation with reported mental health issues. People are using it as a self-medication thing. Those are some of the trends that we're seeing. Harris notes that there were many different ways to consume cannabis in 2022. The stoner's toolbox of bongs, pipes, rolling papers has been made uh, ancillary in Canada or states like Colorado and California, where a sealed pack of THC gummies can be bought in broad daylight over the counter. Harris speculates that edibles may have served as an easy entry point for the fresh pandemic stoners. Certainly, this is true for 35-year-old Toronto uh, resident Evan, uh, Andrew Evans. Sorry, He tells me that he had spent maybe $10 total on weed in his life before COVID, but now says a minor dosage has become a near daily routine. The legalization efforts north of the border sanded away any apprehensions Evans had about having a bad experience. He always knows that what he's getting is whatever is printed on the label, which offered far more chem chemical transparency than a mysterious bag of homemade weed brownies. We all spent lockdown willing to try anything, anything, to feel better. What better time to experiment? I started dabbling with low doses and found I liked how it turned down the volume knob on my bad brain. By Christmas, I was absolutely a weed person, as I started pushing gummies on my 60-something-year-old parents, he says. Weed has significantly improved my quality of life in a remarkably short period of time. Mentally and physically, I'm in a way better place aside from the marked increase in chip consumption. <laughs> Evan says he drinks much less than he did before the pandemic, which he believes is both a symptom of extended isolation and the acute afternoon destroying hangovers that heavy drinkers are forced to contend with. Eventually, the charm of drinking three local IPAs and falling asleep watching Superstore just wore off, he says. Evan's observation bears truth in the data. An increasing number of people are abstaining from alcohol, which Meg Barrand a 38-year-old civil engineer and mother of three in Austin believes, is a rebound effect from early pandemic debauchery. I think a lot of people started drinking more during isolation and then perhaps tried to balance that with weed for health reasons, she says. Bernhard also became a daily smoker after COVID st struck the country. I feel it helps me engage with my kids when I'm tired. 
play games, watch kid movies, and so on. Nobody knows if the pandemic stoners will keep up the habit as the world mercifully starts to turn on its axis again. Amid all these readily available vaccines and a hopeful respite from Omicron wave, it is no longer taboo for Richard Capuano to book a long, wine-soaked dinner with friends. This is a tenacious reality. We've all learned to never underestimate COVID. But Capuano says that he no longer needs the drug to help him cope. And therefore, as a newly minted weed adherent, he is already trying to cut down on a pattern he picked up during lockdown. I'm no longer sitting on my ass waiting for this to be over. I need to get on my, with my life, he says. I still smoke, but now I reserve it for special occasions. And what's a special occasion? Well, that's open for interpretation. <laughs> Cute. International news, uh, Zimbabwe tobacco industry considers switching to cannabis. They're, they're, uh, that's their third biggest crop. It's down... Uh, it's down to $794 million, which it was one up so almost a billion dollars. So they're thinking about switching. There's some contrast. Authorities are already planning for cannabis to be the country's largest cash crop. Uh, so we'll see. Good luck, Zimbabwe. Hopefully you grow some good weed. Send me some. Uh, cannabis sales grow in Israel. Uh, pretty good. I mean, Dr. Michellan, baby, did it all. The godfather, the grandfather of cannabis. British Columbia is considering recreational cannabis con- consumption spaces. Good for you. Do it. Um, Mrs. Wee Main. Yes. Do you like perfume pot? Do you like mixing them together? Sure. Do you want all of them? You actually wear a really nice perfume. Okay, so. I do. I try. <laughs> well, I like it. I love it. But I know a lot of people don't love perfume. Period. But it's a scent. It's a scent that you, that you wear. Yes. It's a beautiful scent. So there is some theories behind pot and perfume, and the power and joy of pairing fragrances. Exhausted with greasy hair from neglecting hygiene for the sake of deadlines, I pluck my birthday cake cannabis flower from my prized apothecary. I open the stash jar and inhale. My nose fills with a comforting vanilla scent. Yep, this is the weed I need. Smelling your flower or cannabis product is a critical component of the cannabis experience. As a bud tender early in my career, I learned that the nose knows meaning that there is no better way of choosing the right flower for you than by smelling it. That is written by Veronica Paz Booth. She is the Director of Education for Item 9 Lab Corps. Uh, The indica-dominant hybrid birthday cake is known for its relaxing effects. Ideal for unwinding after a long workday. After a few puffs, my home office smells like an infused cake dripping in honey. And in a few minutes, my stress level is lower. While, let's be honest, the THC does the heavy lifting, the strained birthday cake is rich in carophylline, a spicy terpene that acts as a cannabinoid, which is also found in cinnamon and clove. Carophylline may have anti-inflammatory and stress-reducing properties. Terpenes are naturally occurring chemical compounds found in plants, such as cannabis, even in some animals. They're responsible for the aromas, flavors, and even colors associated with various vegetation. Terpenes help make certain strains smell or taste different from others. However, that's just part of what makes pot also perfume. The essential oils of cannabis give it its signature scent. There are different chemical components to essential oils. I believe over 200 have been discovered. According to traditional naturopath and registered clinical herbalist, Dr. Lakeisha Jenkins, these compounds are associated with creating the scent profile and are primarily found in the plant's trichomes. Historically, the credit has been given to the terpenes. However, new research is crediting newly identified chemical components called volatile sulfur compounds, with actually giving cannabis the skunk smell familiar to most people. While the science of cannabis scent is more complicated than terpenes, the aromatic compounds do lend a hand in fragrance, and not just in pot. For example, limonene, a citrusy terpene found in strains such as the sativa-dominant lemon cake, has a lemon-like odor found in the rind of citrus fruits. Perfumers use limonene to infuse scents with an uplifting spirit. As someone who writes about beauty in addition to cannabis, I understand that costume, makeup, and perfume can boost one's mood, just like finding the right strain of cannabis can. So after I enjoy my birthday cake from my apothecary, I turn to my perfume altar. 
on top of my apothecary, which is filled with essential oils, cannabis, and more, sit rows of perfume. Of course, there's Bredo Rose Noir, a sultry and musky rose option, but I needed something more uplifting than intimidating. So I opted for Annabelle's birthday cake, a sweet, decadent, and ethereal fragrance created by a perfumier, Marissa Zappas, and designed in collaboration with author and astrologer, Annabelle Gatt. A common phrase fans of the perfume use to describe it is comforting, Gat says. The perfume is technically what's known in the perfume world as a gourmand. However, it's not overly sweet. While the packaging may look like you're about to indulge in a sugar rush, there's something extremely playful about it, and it evokes the feeling of being at a fairy tale birthday party. I sprayed it on, the notes of lemon, sugar, cake, fresh out of the oven, and candied rose petals filled my nose and rolled through my body just like the cannabis strain birthday cake did. Research suggests that pot can enhance the senses, especially taste. Could the same be true for smell? Cannabis has been proven to intensify the taste of food. More research is needed to say for certain that cannabis enhances smell. However, Cannabis does have psychoactive properties, meaning it alters how we perceive the world around us and how we relate to it. So your cognition and mood will shift in addition to your perception of your five senses, says board certified physician and CEO of the sanctuary, Dr. Benjamin Beatty, who has shifted to alternative medicine practices. However, I can personally attest that stoned perfume sampling is much more fun and, in my experience, effective than testing fragrances without an elevated state of mind. It's worth noting that while pot and perfume are comparable in mood and scent, most modern fragrances are not made with plant medicine in mind. I would say in in commercial perfumery, the idea of plants as medicine is not so much taken into account, but I do frequently choose specific raw materials based on their more esoteric qualities rather than their olfactive qualities, Zappa says. However, my mood did shift after applying Annabelle's birthday cake. I felt calm and pretty, and pretty rather than frazzled and in desperate need of a shower. Of course, getting high certainly helped, but I couldn't help but wonder, did the perfume help amplify the effects of a comparable cannabis strain? Beauty entrepreneurs with the cannabis space certainly think so and consider perfume pairing when creating new products. Our Keep Calm bath bomb bomb dropped into a hot soak as a decompressing reward at the end of a whirlwind kind of day. We chose specific scents that, when combined with CBD, induce therapeutic benefits, says Laura Eisman, co-founder of Her Highness, a New York City-based glamorous cannabis brand. Lavender, jasmine, rose, and chamomile all promote anti-anxiety, helping you to relax and calm down. Plus, they're all flowers, she adds. Of course, we don't always want to relax. There's a reason why busy New York City's favorite cannabis strain tends to be sour diesel and the aptly named New York City diesel. Similar to essential oils, different cannabis strains invoke different feelings. For example, a strain high in limonene would give off a pungent, tangy, citrusy smell, producing an uplifted, energized effect, while a strain high in the terpene linalool would smell more flowery and herbal, producing a calming effect. Linalool is found in such plants as coriander, lavender, and rosewood, says Dr. Beatty. When I ask Zappas to recommend an activating perfume to provide a boost similar to an energetic strain, she recommended the Sun Card. With floral and spicy notes of sweet orange, a spritz with a spliff will take you right back to your last beach vacation. Certain smells, like certain memories, have the power to really influence our moods, Zappa says. There is, after all, science that suggests that smell is connected to memory. While some sour diesel in your lungs and wearing a citrus perfume might automatically direct your brain back to sandy beach sex, If you approach both (laughs) pot and perfume like a witch and a connoisseur, you can use this to your advantage. If you smell a perfume that reminds you of an old friend, it might make you feel sad or pleasantly wistful, depending on your relationship with them. We all have smells we associate with happy memories or with feelings of romance or confidence or even spirituality. 
Perfume is so exciting because as you explore scents, you learn more about yourself, Gat says. You have this extra tool that you can use to cultivate a vibe around you to cheer up, relax, feel romantic, or whatever it is that you're seeking. Think of it as a lucid dream while conscious. Because we all have different dreams and react differently to pot, one person's spliff might work like a cup of coffee, but give it to someone else and it could ruin their entire workday. And like pot, perfume is a personal experience. I got to agree with perfume. You know how sensitive I am to certain perfumes yeah. and scents, man. Yeah. I just got to run to some sense that you're work. super sensitive to certain strains oh, like yeah. high sativa. Oh, yeah. <laughs> 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 makes you nuts. Uh, so she said, uh, I wear Annabelle's birthday cake every day, but for some, it might be a date perfume since it has flirtatious qualities to it. And for others, it might be something they would wear out with friends because the perfume has such a fun personality, Gat says. So whether you're pairing an uplifting citrus perfume, such as Replica under the lemon trees with a hybrid strain tangerine or calming down with cannabis as a perfume itself remember that putting on perfume is a ritual and so is consuming cannabis appreciate the aroma and take in the bouquet of that beautiful plant much like the appreciation of fragrance when grinding coffee beans in the morning or opening (laughs) a bottle of wine on a relaxing evening opening a jar of cannabis flower and grinding that flower should be an aromatic experience. It's a beautiful experience. Enjoy it. Beautiful yeah, experience. It is. Beautiful. Great article. Yeah. Good stuff to learn about that. Um, Elon Musk uh, posted weed smoking photo after getting on Twitter board. He uh, bought like 9% of their of their stocks and now he's going to make some decisions on there. Like, so, smoked a joint in celebration. Hm. And then, I have not watched a PBS show in years. And I used to love Nova when I was a kid, but because of now streaming services i can watch all the animal shows i want and not have to wait for a weekly show but they are doing a um uh nova the cannabis question it uh eaten dab vaped and smoked cannabis use is on the rise and our nation is at its crossroads the cannabis question nova explores a relationship with cannabis uncovers the scientists have discovered about the parts effects on the body and brain and examines the criminalization as disproportionately targeted communities of color over several decades Cannabis is growing into a multi-billion dollar industry as it moves out of the shadow of the illicit market and into newly legalized mainstream commerce. Nearly 55 million Americans say they currently use it, and yet they are surprisingly little scientific investigation of the plant in the United States because they don't want us to know about it. They want to keep it hidden. The cannabis question follows scientists leading research on the endocannabinoid system, a collection of chemicals and receptors throughout the brain and body to help the body mainstream balance and, and homeostasis. In fact, the cannabinoid receptors named after cannabis is the most abundant receptor in the brain. Receptors bind with your own cannabis-like molecules to regulate key functions such as appetite, cognition, memory, and emotion. Uh, we'll hear from personal stories from people who use the, uh, it to treat side effects from chemotherapy, PTSD, anxiety, and chronic pain. It follows Stanford neurologist Catherine Jacobson, who experimented with CBD extracts as a treatment for her son. Uh, her work paved the way for the FDA to prove cannabis-related uh, epidiolex and can be prescribed to treat seizures. Scientists are just beginning to explore the question about the risk um, of recreational use may pose to a developing brain. So we'll learn about that. The film also looks at the history of criminalization in the U.S., uh, which started at, in 1937, at a time when the government officials tapped into the prejudice towards Mexican immigrants, de- demoni- demonizing the Mexican-Spanish words of cannabis uh, marijuana and claiming it caused violent and defiant sexual acts. In the 1970s, Richard Nixon ignored the expert panel recommending decriminalization and declared a war on drugs. Someone made fun of me because of the last episode I said drugs on war. Remember that? You yeah. called me out on that the next day. <laughs> <laughs> which targeted racial youth the poor especially people of color uh so i'm i can't wait to watch it it's uh, i know you most of you probably won't hear this when i when i talk about it but you could probably look back on pbs and maybe re- stream it from somewhere nova the cannabis question on on witf tv wednesday april 13th at 9 p.m or on demand through the free pbs video app or video.witf.org i think that's awesome hopefully you guys watch it i think it's gonna be dope i can't wait to watch it it's, i actually set it to my calendar <laughs> that's how bad i want to watch it so uh, Ms. Weeman, you got anything else to say? I I say just explore, learn more about weed. It's good. Cool. Yeah, that's love it. it. I'm, I'm gonna let that E&B. was really that was a very inspirational thought. It was. It's I'm been really... a while since you gave one at the end <laughs> of the show. <laughs> <laughs> that was pretty bad. No, it was, it was good. No, I've got nothing else. Nothing else. Well, nothing. we're gonna let E and B uh, throw a little 420 in heaven for us. Thank you.
There's more to that song, but you can go check them out on Spotify. It's Ian B at 420 in Heaven. Shout out to Ian out there. Thanks for sending us a song. I really like it. It's going to be my 420 song when I smoke a big fat doink. <laughs> it was pretty good. <laughs> it was good. Hey, everybody out in the world, we love you all. Don't forget to check us out on all of our social media handles and YouTube and all that. And uh, as Paulie always says, smoke smart. Puff, puffing away. Puff, puff, pass.